resentment and forgiveness. Uh, you know, I guess if we really wanted to see resentment in action, we could turn on the news. You know, there's a lot going on in our government right now. Uh, but, you know, instead of watching that, uh, you know, and I, I have been because I'm very much interested and it is, you know, it's history making what's happening in our country. <clears throat> but I do want to talk about resentments and, you know, in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, it says that re resentment is the number one offender. It's the number one offender and it will get people back in their addiction quicker than anything is having a resentment and holding on to it. You know, for those of, <clears throat> that are, of us that are addicts, that is a, uh, a feeling uh, that, you know, we have, uh, <laughs> we don't get to do. I mean, we can have a resentment uh, as an addict, but I'll tell you what, we must find a way ASAP to resolve that resentment. Because what a resentment is, you know, S-E-N-T is a Greek word, comes from a Greek word, sentiri, that means to feel. And so all our resentment is, is we refill and we replay the same thing over and over. Maybe someone did something to you 15 years ago, 20 years ago, and you got you get up in the morning and you get to thinking about what they did to you. Now, the the good part of being, I mean, there's lots of wonderful good parts of being uh, in a 12-step program. <clears throat> but what we get to do is inventory those resentments. And then we get to, uh, you know, there's a process in how to get rid of the resentment. You know, resentment is, uh, you know, so if you are still hanging on to something that happened 15 or 20 years ago and you're in a 12-step program, you might want to get with your sponsor and do another fourth and fifth step. But anyway, a resentment broken down, resentment, like I said, is to refill, replay, somebody did us wrong, and we think about it over and over and over. And guess what? People are going to do us wrong. We are fallible human beings, and we do other people wrong, and they do us wrong. But for us to hold on to that, <clears throat> you know, resentment is like you take poison expecting the other person to die, and you just keep taking it over and over and every day, every day. And, you know, nine times out of ten, I don't even know that you have a resentment. Now, I want to make a clarity here about... Uh, any children that were abused, any form of childhood abuse, you're a victim. You have no part in that, absolutely zero part in any abuse that you suffered as a child. Now, <clears throat> to, and, you know, and, but it's important to work through that abuse to get to the other side, and depending on the uh, length of the time of the abuse, how long it went on, who it was, particularly if it was a family member, it takes longer to work through the abuse. So I don't want you to hear <laughs> that uh, you need to get over this real quick. That is different. Uh, you're not a victim. You're not the victim. <clears throat> uh, you've been victimized, but you are not guilty as a child. When Yes, you were the victim, uh, and you were victimized, but you are not guilty of anything, any part of your abuse. I just wanted to clarify that. <clears throat> now, in our adult life, guess what? We are. We play a part in it, uh, and we are responsible uh, for the sorry state of our affairs and for the good things in our life. But when we have a resentment towards someone, resentment is to, like I said, is to refill and replay over and over and over what they did to us. And then what happens is, let's say, for instance, someone did you wrong on the job, your employer, or you're mad at your spouse, or someone, you had that emotional build up, build up, build up. You had that resentment burning, stewing in your, you know, in your gut. And then you go and you just give them a piece of your mind and you blow up at them. <laughs> That's what a rager does. And I spent the first part of my life as a rager. By the grace of God, I haven't raged in 19 years. And that is a miracle beyond all miracles. So I know what it feels like to be a rager, to have that emotional build up, build up, build up and blow up. 
so you have a resentment and then you blow up at someone and then you pull back and you get home and you know you get to thinking about what you did and you thought think oh my god i should not have done that one more time i showed my ass you know i should not you know we'll shit on ourselves and you get to be a man at yourself so not only do you have a resentment to, toward that other person which, you know, getting mad at someone doesn't resolve the resentment, doesn't resolve the problem. So you got mad at them and you blew up. Now you're mad at yourself for blowing up. And that's a self-resentment. And a self-resentment is, uh, I mean, it eats away at us. <laughs> like that acid, you know. Uh, acid uh, is... <clears throat> you know, eats out the container that holds it. And so when we have that resentment uh, brewing and now we're mad at ourselves, why did we do that and all that? And then we stop and we get to thinking, well, if they hadn't done that to me, I wouldn't have had to blown up at them. You know, they're more wrong than I am. And so we move from a resentment to a self-resentment, you know, we're mad at them, now we're mad at ourselves for blowing up at them, and now we get to thinking about it, and we think, well, they did more to us than, they, than we did to them. So we move to self-pity. Now, self-pity is the absolute worst emotion, a feeling that an addict can have. Because when we get to self-pity, it's about the poor me's. Pour me, pour me, pour me another drink, pour me another milkshake. It's a bless my heart. That is a dangerous place for an addict to get. Now, normies who do not have use any addiction, you know, you can be resentful all you want to. You can be miserable having it. But for addicts, it's different. We are, uh, you know, we are feeling people. Addicts have, it's a, a, any form of addiction is a disease of the feelings. We have big feelings. And those are the things that will take us back to our substance every time, whether it's overeating, undereating, binge and purging, whether they're acting out sexually, whether they're dating spending, work addiction, alcohol, drugs, you name it. If we allow ourselves to have a resentment long enough for it to eat on us, we will find something to ease that pain. So, uh, that I want to keep saying about this childhood abuse. <clears throat> you know, you have every right to have a resentment toward what happened to you. Now, also, it's so important to work on the abuse and to work on those resentments uh, and to continue to do the work because otherwise <clears throat> you give the power to the perpetrator. The perpetrator keeps re-abusing you every day or every time you think about the abuse and you haven't done and you haven't completed your work. And I want to tell you, childhood abuse, it takes a while. Don't rush yourself. It's about peeling off layers. And what, you know, what I had to do was, you know, when the pain would come up, I'd go do something. I'd go do an eight-day program, a six-day, a 30-day, whatever. It took me about 12 years to completely work through the abuse. But one day I woke up and I thought, I'm finished. I am done. I am complete. Uh, you know, I can talk about the abuse, like talking about news, weather, and sports. I don't go around talking about it. I'm willing to share my story to anyone. And the, the, the childhood abuse uh, will absolutely eat you up as an adult if you don't continue to work on it and, you know, and give the abuse back to where it belongs. And that's where it takes really good therapy and talk therapy works for a while. Talk therapy will help you get your story straight. And, you know, the talk therapist will give you some assignments and you know, and writing is a really good way to get rid of a resentment and to, you know, where you write about it. But after a while, <clears throat> see, this affects us, a resentment affects us uh, not only uh, emotionally and mentally, it affects us physically. And the issues are in the tissues. They live in the very issue, uh, tissues of our bodies. 
So that's why we believe in the type of work that we do, where you can bring that anger and that shame up out of your body and, you know, give it back to the perpetrator, not to them. They're not brought into the room, but in your imagination. Because when you've had any kind of resentment, what you do, you, or what, you know, anyone does with the resentment, we get up in the morning and we reimagine. You know, that comes out of our imagination. We re-image one more time the resentment and we replay it over and over and over in our head. So, hanging on to a resentment uh, makes us be the victim. And I'll tell you, the victim in any situation, in any family, has the power. I want you to think about that. You know, it seems like the victim, you know, is weak, bless their hearts and all. But, you know, being a victim can be very powerful because it gathers steam and it will gather people around us and we want people to, we may not intentionally do this, uh, but people, uh, you know, our families, when we remain the victim, everyone around us knows it. And, you know, family members particularly, when we're carrying that, being that victim and that victimization around with us, a lot of times our family members will walk on eggshells not to upset us, you know. And that in itself can be, uh, a, you know, abusive to the family uh, because when we uh, stay in the victimization, stay in being a victim. Now, victims blame others. Now, I will tell you, in our childhood, I want you to keep hearing me, you have no responsibility when you were abused as a child. You were the victim. But in your adult life, you don't have to stay the victim. There is a work that you can do to get out of that victimization, that victim role. <clears throat> but victims uh, sometimes uh, will only blame themselves. Victims will take it all on and blame themselves. Now, sometimes we will blame other people. So we blame ourselves, we blame other people. We stay in that victimization. <clears throat> and what happens is we must stop blaming people. Stuff happens, abuse happens. Uh, now, we don't, may, we don't need to not keep people accountable, but we must, for our own sanity, Stop just putting the blame, just keep blaming, blaming, blaming. Uh, and I will tell you, uh, to do this, to stop blaming people, we have to first blame them. It took me a long time to own that my father had abused me. I did not want to blame him, and I would make every excuse in the world for him. I'd say, well, he didn't know. He thought I was my mother. Uh, I'd always slept in the bed with him since the day I was brought home from the hospital. He didn't know. I'd make excuses for him until I was down in Florida working with a therapist, and I thought she was going to beat me to death with one of those bats if I didn't finally admit that I had been abused by my father. I didn't want to go there. I did not want to blame him. I wanted to carry it all myself. And how I carried it is I ate over that abuse. I started eating over it very early, and I ate, and I ate. There wasn't enough food, enough sugar to fill up that hole in my soul until I began to do the hard work <clears throat> on those uh, that abuse. And we have to own it, and we have to blame them, you know. We have to blame them, but to stay in the blame game, re re we remain a victim. So... You know, it's a process. We need to do the deep kind of work that we can do to get ourselves and to give that shame and give the blame back to the perpetrator. And uh, one of the things is, uh, you know, to realize that we were victimized. We were victimized. Now, in our adult life, you know, we can be... And I've, I've, I had a woman really challenge me on this. You know, in childhood, <clears throat> when we're abused, we are the victim. And we have no choice in that. In our adult life, we do have a choice. It's like, <clears throat> you know, harm me one time, 
shame on you. Harm me the second, third, fourth, fifth, twentieth time, shame on me. You know, I've worked with uh, with many, or tried to, uh, people that have suffered from domestic violence, and they're the, some of the hardest people in the world to work with because somewhere deep down inside of them, they feel like they deserve the abuse that they're getting from the abuser. Uh, and so it is about uh, taking responsibility, you know, and not putting yourself in harm's way over and over and over again. And it's hard, I, you know, to get out of, of uh, where there's domestic violence or <clears throat> so, and it takes work and it is possible. So one of the things that is uh, that you can start just a very small, I mean, it's not small, is uh, when you are ready to recognize that you have been abused and maybe it's in your adult life. Maybe something's happened. Somebody has hurt your feelings. And, uh, you know, I have this feeling about when I talk about hurt, you know, Eleanor Roosevelt gave us this, that no one can hurt our feelings without our permission. You know, that's why here at Shades, we talk and teach a lot about boundary setting, boundaries, 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 and having some healthy self-esteem. Victims give all of their esteem, their self-esteem to the perpetrator. That's where their esteem goes. And so recovery is about, you know, finding a way to get some healthy self-esteem on board. And, you know, I, will believe, I do believe a lot of that is about, uh, you know, accepting the God of our, our understanding and knowing that, uh, you know, I've heard, well, why did, you know, if there is a God, why did God allow my father or so-and-so to abuse me? You know, God could have made us all robots and he could have made us any way that we want, he wanted to. But he gave us a free will. He gave the perpetrators a free will. They could do as much damage as they wanted. I mean, he gave us a free will. Now, on the other side of that, when we reach out to the God of our understanding, that's where our esteem is going to come from, our, our healthy self-esteem. And if you're in a 12-step program and you have a good sponsor, that's where you're going to get your healthy self-esteem. Because if you didn't get it in childhood, you can get it in a 12-step program. A good sponsor is going to have some healthy self-esteem. And they're going to teach you by their actions. They're not going to sit down and give you lessons. But you watch a healthy sponsor. Because what they do is they take care of themselves. Uh, and they say yes when they can say yes to you. And when they don't, they say no to you. You know, if they can't. You know, do something, you know, when you, or take a call or whatever. You know, healthy self-esteem is being able to take care of ourselves and say no when no is appropriate. So a healthy sponsor in a 12-step program is one of the keys to having healthy self-esteem. Because self-esteem comes from parents. And if we have parents that didn't have healthy self-esteem themselves, how could they pass it on to us? So, one of the things you can do, which I said, started to tell you, uh, pen to paper are two of the best tools that there are. Pen to paper. You taking a pen and putting it in your hand, and I don't mean a computer, I mean pen to paper, and write a letter to your perpetrator. Those, using those small motor skills will wake, wake your brain up. And when your brain wakes up, you know, there's a part of the brain when there has been childhood abuse that there's a part of the brain that gets off track. Now, I'm not a psychiatrist, and I'm not going to give you all those terms, uh, but simply put, abuse gets the brain off track. There are really good therapeutic uh, interventions today, such as EMDR, that helps that. Now... For me, I do not recommend people doing EMDR until they have done a lot of deep release work. You do your shame reduction work, your anger reduction work, and you pretty much <clears throat> get kind of clear of the past and then do EMDR and you'll be amazed at what will happen when you do eight, 10 sessions of EMDR. So go back to writing the letter. 
write a letter to your perpetrator. And, and if you were a child, write it with your non-dominant hand. Write it with a non-dominant hand to your perpetrator. And then tell the perpetrator how they hurt you. Now, I have this deal about hurt. You have to be careful with hurt. You know, uh, like I said, you know, no one can hurt our feelings without our permission. We don't want to stay in the hurt because it's almost manipulative in saying, you hurt my feelings. Uh, you hurt my feelings. <clears throat> There's a difference in saying that in saying, when you, whatever the action is, you did, what I think about that is, you know, I think you're a jerk for doing it or whatever, and I allow myself to feel anger. Anger is energizing. Anger is energizing. It, anger used in the right way is healthy. And that's what we're really going to be talking about next week in depth is more about anger. So write a letter to your per perpetrator. Uh, and particularly, uh, you know, if you can't talk to the person, uh, you know, face to face, and p particularly if they are have passed away, write the letter. And then <clears throat> feel the feelings, feel the feelings of, of the abuse, feel the feelings of the uh, resentment. And so if someone has done something to you, I was telling my friend Misty the other day, and <clears throat> when I was in the second grade, I'm going to tell you how resentments can stay with you. When I was in the second grade, <laughs> I was uh, sat behind this little girl, and I was a little fat girl, and this little girl that sat in front of me was cute, precious, and darling, and it was evident that she was from a wealthy family, and everybody loved her, and I didn't think anybody liked me, and she had the prettiest pencils, all color of pencils, and that was a novelty back then, and she'd go up and sharpen those pencils, and all the boys would look at her, and one day I asked her, if I could borrow one of her pencils, and I was so bashful, I couldn't hardly say a word. And she took one of those real sharp pencils and hit, hit me right in the palm of my hand. Dug in, and it's still in there, the lead. I and mean, I can kind of vainly, <laughs> faintly say, I felt it last night. I guess I was preparing for this. I could feel that uh, lead, you know, in there. And I held on to that resentment. I was res I resented her not only for hitting me, but for being cuter than me, for being popular, for being rich. I resented that woman, that girl, for everything. Now, I don't know where she wound up in her adult life, but I sure gave her a lot of power until I got to a 12-step program. And that's, you know, second grade stuff. She was at the top of my list. <laughs> so... You know, we got to look at this stuff and be willing to get uh, past it because those are the things that live rent free in our head. You know, we refill, replay, refill, you know. And so, <clears throat> feel the feelings of whatever anyone has done to you. We, we do need to feel the feelings, but do your work around it. Do your work. And then at some point, we're going to have to move to forgiveness. Now, I'm, you know, when we do Family Week, and a lot of you on this have done Family Week, uh, we do a forgiveness exercise, and I encourage people, don't just say, I forgive you, you know, just like that, because you're going to have to really feel the feelings, feel the hurt, feel the pain, feel the anger of what another person has done to you to feel that before you can reach a place of real forgiveness. Now, forgiveness is not uh, forgetting. You may not ever forget what the person has done. You may not ever forget it. <clears throat> but what you can do, you can be willing to give up the hurt and the pain. Because as long as we hang on to the hurt and the pain, we began to re-victimize ourselves every day by replaying what somebody has done to us over and over and over. Uh, and so, like I said, to get to a place of forgiveness, we must feel the feelings uh, and to uh, forget, you know, get to the place of, uh, of, of feeling the, 
the feelings uh, as we must release the negative feelings. I'm just sort of, uh, and we need to do that verbally and physically. And anyone that's done work here at Shades, you know what I'm talking about, to verbally and physically give back those feelings that you're carrying of shame and anger to the perpetrator. Uh, so, another thing is stop blaming ourselves and stop blaming others. I was all for blaming myself. I would take the blame for everything. And I'll tell you what kept me hung up on that, on blaming myself, uh, is my character defect of rage. You know, I was, was in recovery for years, for years before, I, and I could not give up the rage. I was raised by a rager, and I'll tell you, if you are a rager, you get a lot out of being a rager. I mean, that emotional build up, build up, that anger builds up, builds up, build. you blow up, and then you feel great. You feel great, and then the bodies are all laying around, and what you want to do is everybody get up and go play now, or, you know, because you feel better once you have that release of the rage. That was a character defect of me, of mine, that kept me uh, bondage for a long time. And, uh, you know, I could contain it around some people, uh, but not everyone. I've had to go back and make amends to former clients. I've had to go make amends to former employees. Uh, and, you know, I'll spend the rest of my life making amends to my children. And the way I make amends, I love what my daughter Kim says, that the way she makes amends is that she has mended her behavior. And that's what we have to do is mend our behavior. We don't act the way that we did before. I'm no longer a rager. I mean, and I very seldom get angry. I mean, if I do, I mean, I just don't. But if I do, I you know, will go to the person, I'll talk about it, I'll talk to someone else about it, I'll write about it, and nine times out of 10, I don't even need to go talk to the other person. It was something usually I made up in my head. You know, I don't know if y'all do that, but I can make up a whole lot of stuff in my head. So, uh, one of the things is when you start, uh, you know, not blaming yourselves or blaming others, one of the things is separate the person from the behavior. Separate the person from the behavior. Uh, you know, because, you know, I think back about my beloved Mr. Mike, my husband. Uh, and, the, you know, he's been gone seven years, and the longer he's gone, we have got him elevated up so high into sainthood. It's, I mean, I hardly ever remember anything negative about him, but he had a few little negative things, particularly during his uh, alcoholism. But, you know, I was thinking about that. You know, he was one of those gentle, quiet drunks. He just wanted to drink, pass out, and wake up and go on, you know. But I wouldn't allow, allow that, you know. I was the rager, and you know, y'all heard the story. I beat him up for vacuum cleaner hose one time, and then after that, every time he'd come in drunk, I'd beat him up for vacuum cleaner hose. Uh, and so, you know, I had a lot more amends to make to my husband than he had to make to me. My husband was suffering from the disease of alcoholism. What was wrong with me? I was suffering from untreated codependency and untreated rage, you know. And so we both had to make amends to each other, but how we made amends to each other is we mended our behavior. We quit acting the way that we had acted before. And I want to tell you about Mr. Mack. <laughs> you know, I went through my life, I always wanted to be special to someone, and I wanted someone to love and adore me. Well, I got it. You know, we were married 51 years, and, uh, you know, he didn't know how to love. And I told you the story, but I had to teach him how to love me. If you're with someone that can't show you love, it's your responsibility to teach them. They may not know how to do it, and they may not know what it takes for you to feel love. So, you know, grow yourself up and teach your partner what you need. And to feel loved, and you know, I had the opportunity to, tell, to teach Mr. Mack that, and I'll tell you what, he was a willing student, and you know, we had, when he passed away, he had 32 years of sobriety, 
and we had 30 good years, the first two years of his sobriety, and I'd been in al for years, 14, when he sobered up. First two years of his sobriety, I wouldn't have given you a plug nickel for our marriage because it wasn't good. But after that, you know, it takes people a while to sober up. You know, not drinking or not using a substance is not being sober. <laughs> you can be dry and, you, and not be emotionally sober. But after he sobered up emotionally, he became one of the most loving men. And uh, he was a gentleman. He was a gentleman. So I'm going to get myself to crying, so I'm going to uh, get past that. But anyway, uh, don't leave until the miracle. If you're in a relationship with someone, uh, you know, and you really care about that person, if you're married or have in a committed relationship, what I say is stay in toe-to-toe, face-to-face, and duke it out until you can get to a place of, you know, where the resentments aren't so big and the forgiveness is bigger. Uh, and if you're in an abusive relationship, I never tell anybody to get out, but, you know, if you're in an abusive relationship, you are re-abusing yourself by staying in it. So, with all that, I will, uh, so, the thing about it is, you've got, we've got to make a decision. Do we want to keep on hanging on to old resentments? Are they really, uh, you know, working for us? Or do we want to live free of them? And if you want to live free of them, you got to work on them. And in our adult life, whether we like it or not, you know, people may do really bad things to us, but at some point we have had our part in that resentment. And that is all we can change. And this is why the 12-step program is so beautiful. You know, Bill, and I think God really directed him, when he, you know, laid out that four step, guess what? We list all of those resentments, everybody we resent and what they did to us, we get to take their inventory first. You know, and we write down everything those people did to us. He was a master. I mean, God, I think, really worked through them. And then we get to write down all of our fears and all of our problems in the sex area. But then, you know what? In that fifth step, or at the end of that fourth step, what we get to look at is our part. And that's all we can change. And in our adult life, it doesn't matter, particularly if you're an addict, it does not matter what other people have done to you. What matters is what you're holding on to that they've done and how you treat them. That is what matters, is how you treat other people. Because you've got to live with yourself every day. You know, they may not live, have to live with you, but we have to live with ourselves every day. And when we treat people bad, it's going to come back to us full force. So, uh, I think I have gone, stopped sharing and gone to preaching, like I do sometimes. But resentment is about revealing, resensing, it's just about hanging on to old stuff. And forgiveness is about release and letting go. Release and letting go. So, with that, let's open it up. We've got some long-term people here. We've got some people that have been around a while that are working diligently on their recovery. Uh, some new people that are working hard. Uh, tell us about, uh, talk to us. Do you have a resentment you can't get past? Or have you worked through uh, some of these things?